Hey guys, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to a new series that I wanted to start for a bit called Bestsellers That I've Missed featuring best-selling books that I've missed. Yes. <laughs> you know, as a writer I feel like there's a lot that can be learned from books that reach that level of hype, that many sales and reviews, that sort of pinnacle of love from readers. But also as a longtime booktube viewer, frankly, I often feel the FOMO. There are just so many books. Truly the best problem to have. But there are so many books. And as I'm not quite reading a hundred books a year, <laughs> not yet. I have friends that do but I am not there yet. You know that means I, I'm missing a lot. I'm missing a lot of new releases. I'm missing a lot of last year's releases. And as someone who really loves and appreciates a lot of different genres, it just it all adds up. So basically this series is my way of fixing that FOMO just years later. And I figured what better book to start out with than one that is about to become a TV series later this year. <laughs> Daisy Jones and the Six. That was a throwback book to drop. Very like 2018-ish maybe. <laughs> so when we're talking about bestseller, right? This book's a fucking bestseller. It has sold over a million copies which is so wild to me to try and comprehend. I mean I guess as a writer like just having one person buy and read your book is amazing. Uh, but then having, you know, a hundred is like, what? And then a thousand, it's like, what? And then 10,000, it's like, I, that feels <laughs> insane. And in, if it was all within a week and on some weeks, that itself would be a bestseller. A fucking million. <laughs> this book was published in March of 2019 and very quickly became, actually, I think before it was even released, uh, a Reese's Book Club pick um, and not too many months later it was announced that she had actually acquired this book and was partnering up with Amazon to make this series. Daisy Jones and the Six has over 600,000 ratings on Goodreads and over 80,000 reviews with a 4.24 star average as of this recording. So remembering back to the time of this book's release and the hype around it, it was very very high especially because Taylor Jenkins Reid's other book Oh, where art thou book? Where did I put it? I did read this book and it broke me, okay? <laughs> broke, absolutely destroyed by this book. And it, by the way, has been on the New York Times paperback bestseller list for 65 weeks and was on the hardcover list for I don't know how many weeks before that. So the hype, right? It was intense. I remember there were people posting like song covers because I think the lyrics are in the book. The fashion was a really big part of it with people dressing as the characters and the absolutely rave reviews and reading vlogs and just like the thumbnails with people and <laughs> their tear stained cheeks sobbing. But my love of Evelyn Hugo is what got me to finally pick this book up. I needed this book. I've needed this book for a while wanted to know if Taylor Jenkins Reid could do it to me again. <laughs> and frankly if she even comes like halfway close then this would still be a really fucking great book. <laughs> and editing Kate is just going to put some snapshots from later on in the vlog to sort of suss out if that prediction was true. <laughs> so let us read the inside flap and figure out what this book is about and we will start the reading vlog. Shall we? Uh, there will be spoilers. This is your last chance warning. Okay. Let's do this. Everyone knows Daisy Jones and the Six. The band's album Aurora came to define the rock and roll era of the late 70s, and an entire generation of girls wanted to grow up to be Daisy. But no one knows the reason behind the group split on the night of their final concert at Chicago Stadium on July 12, 1979, until now. Daisy is a girl coming of age in LA in the late 60s, sneaking into clubs on the Sunset Strip, sleeping with rock stars, and dreaming of singing at the Whiskey A Go Go. The sex and drugs are thrilling, but it's the rock and roll she loves most. By the time she's 20, her voice is getting noticed, and she has the kind of heedless beauty that makes people do crazy things. Also getting noticed is The Six, a band led by the brooding Billy Dunn. On the eve of their first tour, his girlfriend Camila finds out she's pregnant, and with the pressure of impending fatherhood and fame, Billy goes a little wild on the road. Daisy and Billy cross paths when a producer realizes that the key to supercharged success is to put the two together. What happens next will become the stuff of legend. The making of that legend is chronicled in this riveting and unforgettable novel written as an oral history of one of the biggest bands of the 70s. Taylor Jenkins Reid is a talented writer who takes her work to a new level, Daisy Jones and Six, brilliantly capturing a place and time in an utterly distinctive voice. Okay. 
Let's do this. I'll do soon. Author's note. Over the course of the last eight years, I've conducted individual interviews of current and former members of the band, as well as family, friends, and industry elite who surrounded them at the time. I love when the author's note sort of plays into the concept of the book. So we have both the author who is Taylor Jenkins Reid, and then we have the author who is the one who compiled the notes and did the interviews, right? And so it's kind of the author, the character, and then the actual author. <laughs> But I love that so much. So I'm very excited. Okay, let's go put these into braids and read. We start with the groupie Daisy Jones, 1965 to almost 7.55, which is when I feed the dogs, which is why they're <laughs> being so extra Zelda. But I am curious to see, they're talking about the band, The Six now and how it forms. So I'm sure later we'll get how Daisy joined them. She's like, why are you not feeding me? And Zelda has given up hope. <laughs> I am curious as we go through band members, if one of them or a couple of them have already passed away by the time that this, uh, the interview started because they mentioned that at the beginning. Mm. I feel like that would be a, a gut punch. So I love this style of book. I should preface all of the commentary I'll have about this book based off of that. I love documentaries and this is just like a less visual documentary. <laughs> like the way that it's structured, which is very similar to The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. But one of the things that I think this format really allows is the progression of the story while still dropping these like random truth bombs that like are not the point of the story but you can just kind of gloss over it in a way that if you were if it was more prose based you'd have to kind of linger over and show those moments a little bit more you couldn't just drop something and like move on as easily um so i think that's what makes this so fascinating because there's lots of points that can feel very relevant and really hit you and then and you move on and i think so much of it resonates, right? Because it has more flexibility in that way. I take pictures on my phone <laughs> while I'm reading so that I can return to it. So like, besides my dog, I have three pictures already. Let's see, it was page 32. <laughs> this is when they are meeting with their manager for the first time, sort of, and the manager is basically telling them what they need to do to, to make it. So. Graham says, Rod told me I needed to cut out half of my solos, said they were interesting for people that love technical guitar work, but boring for everyone else. I said, why would I play to people who don't care about good guitar? He said, if you want to be huge, you got to be for everybody. Okay, that's one, two. <laughs> 
Billy, Rod told me to stop writing about stuff I didn't know about. He said, don't reinvent the wheel, write about your girl, hands down, best career advice I ever got. Karen, Rod told me to wear low cut shirts and I said, dream on, and that was the end of that. So we have character building in here. It kind of reaffirms Karen as the character, which is wonderful. Um, but also like two huge things that I think are relevant to anyone in the arts. Even later at some point, yeah, potential is pure fucking joy. What's good is when everybody thinks you're headed somewhere fast, when you're all potential. Potential is pure fucking joy. They talk about how when you're at the top, there's pressure and expectations and that's not the best part of rock and roll. Anyways, I just think it's funny because I think that's true for everything. You could even see it for YouTube or for famous authors or whatever, is that when you're at the top, it does come with a lot of stuff. But when it's like, oh shit, this could be something. That's exciting. That's when people want to get on board. And I think there's like the counter swing that we're seeing a lot. Now there's, or that's always been there, I guess, you know, it's kind of fun to not like the popular thing. So then you get this big bubble and you get, <laughs> anyways, just fascinating. And I would say that there were a couple other random truth bombs that are like dropped and then we gloss over them. Like Camila's love and pride don't mix. And Karen has a lot of them. That's the glory of being a man. An ugly face isn't the end of you. At least that one I could see being a whole scene in itself. Anyways, <laughs> I'm enjoying it so far. We are now at It Girl, uh, 1972 to 1974. So we're back to Daisy and I, love so far the friendship between Simone and Daisy. So I'm excited to see how that continues and how it morphs once it becomes Daisy Jones and the Six. I have a lot of questions about where this is gonna go. Um, you know that there's obviously like an inevitable this, but like when and how does it come back up? Does it come back up? Questions. It is however, 9 a.m. and I do have a live stream to get to, so. Quick writing work break, and then we will be back to the reading for the day. I don't know why I did that. You're just gonna see this. Okay. Ah. Beep, 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 beep. That is time on our first sprint. All right, I got 10 scenes planned out in total during that stream. I got some stuff moved over there for the third episode. And I got a kitten, a puppy, and another puppy hanging out with me. <laughs> but now I think it is time to get back to the book and also do something about these nails. Okay, so I'm now 150 pages in. And there are how many pages in the book? At risk of spoiling myself, there are 350. Okay, so about 25 more to go before I'm halfway. And this one is interesting to me because I am enjoying it, but I also just love interviews and I love the old like uh, behind the band-esque thing. So it feels like that, right? And I'm just like trash for this kind of drama. So it's entertaining. Um, I will say that doing it in this way the character development's kind of funky, right? Because when you're being interviewed after the fact, all of these characters as they're telling the story have had their revelations and epiphanies. And they might be like, I didn't realize at the time, but like the way that they're speaking is with knowledge of all the years as they're telling this, right? So while I think that the way she's written this, you know, we're obviously hiding a lot of what's to come, but it's interesting in that we don't see the same internal growth. So I'm enjoying kind of the facts of the case and I feel like the sort of truth bombs that all the characters get to drop are really cool. But like, again, you don't get to see the growth because the growth's already happened. They're talking, having lived the growth. And so it's a much different story than like firsthand experiencing it with the characters. I did take some more pictures though of bits that I liked. At one point, Billy talks about having success and not feeling like you necessarily deserve it and kind of questioning why am I the one who has it, you know? Especially when one of their original band members died in the war very early on in the book and he talks about that and being like, you know, he didn't deserve that so I don't deserve, you know, it's just kind of these sort of things that you spiral and think about. I like Graham, page 142 says, if you redeem yourself, then believe in your own redemption, which is just like, 
Ooh, that's an interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm waiting for Billy to cheat with Daisy or not because I like the the reasoning early on that we're given from Billy's perspective, which is like, I couldn't be around her because she was using so much and I was trying to stay clean. Um, but everyone else seems to kind of point it like that's not all it is, right? And they're kind of calling him out for it. And he even says at one point that he doesn't want to hear it because he doesn't want to be called out for this kind of growing attraction. And then we have all this sweet stuff with Billy writing the song Aurora about his wife, but also with Daisy in mind to sing it, um, which I think is an artist, you know, he probably did mean the lyrics about his wife in this <laughs> made-up universe. But how much of that plays a part that Daisy's gonna sing the song? I just don't know. Maybe it's because when I read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, Taylor Jenkins Reid kind of broke me a little bit. She broke me in the ways I expected, but also in a couple ways that I was not expecting. So I think there's gonna be some twisty twists here. And I'm wondering if Billy and Daisy hooking up is too obvious a twist? Or what's gonna happen? Hmm. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> I like the characters. I think they're really fun. I think she's done a great job of kind of differentiating some of their, if not their voices, then what they zero in on. You know, like Graham is obsessed with Karen and uh, Warren is joking about Karen hooking up with someone. And then like, he's mostly chill as someone who drummed. Uh, I relate to Warren, <laughs> just minding my own business and watching the nonsense. And then Eddie with being upset about how, you know, Billy's treating everyone. It's just a really interesting, like there are clear differentiations and with how they're talking or maybe what questions the interviewer would have been asking, right? But again, because we don't see that growth in a narrative format um, in real time, it's not that it doesn't pack a punch. I think it still does reading these things, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel the same. Yeah. sharing that tiny little section that's where I was sitting <laughs> are you proud of yourselves are you proud of yourselves is that that so the rumors are true it must be the soldier who took down Regal's champion I forgot my teeth I was not reading for long before I needed to take a break again and I realized I forgot my tea. So now I have a bit of a mixed peach alcoholic tea and it really is delicious. We were getting to this place where it's like, okay, Daisy and Billy are working together now. Again, feeling the vibes. I don't want to feel the vibes. I actually thought at the very beginning that I was like, oh, okay, obviously the lead and Daisy are gonna get together. And then all of a sudden Billy gets a wife and I was like, so I guess they're not gonna get together, but they might still get together now. <laughs> Anyways, we get to this part where it's like, okay, they're working together now. They like respect each other, everything's cool. And then we get to this kind of last bit of the page where, you know, Graham and Karen are also doing fine, sneaking around still, but doing fine and everything's fine. And yeah, Billy and Eddie have some tension about how the guitar riff's gonna go, but like ultimately they like work it out. <laughs> And then we get to this bit about Rod saying, I started to do some calculations. Could we replace Eddie if we needed to? Would Pete leave with him? Blah, 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 blah. Turns out I wasn't reading exactly right, but I saw the writing on the wall. Then we have Warren being like, lol, you don't get a congratulations for noticing this. Like all of us knew that 
something like this was gonna happen. Being proud that you predicted Eddie would leave the band is like saying, I predicted the sun would come out today, the day before a nuclear disaster. Yeah, man, great guess, but you didn't exactly notice the world was ending. And then we have Karen uh, talking about not believing in soulmates anymore. So basically it's like, you know, Karen and Graham are gonna go to shit and you know that the whole band is about to go to shit. Um, obviously this is what we're progressing toward anyways, but I was like, wow, we're really in like, this was all leading up to a false high. And I was like, what page am I on? From about where I was reading 176, 177, and guess the fuck what? The exact middle of the book. The exact middle of the book. Taylor Jenkins read crush the midpoint. <laughs> but it just made me laugh that it like so clearly like nailed the formula that I just had like a little giggle to myself. <laughs> and I tried to tell my partner about it and he was like, okay. <laughs> Although having just checked again, I didn't realize that there were lyrics. I didn't want to look too closely at the back of the book and risk getting a spoiler. 339 or so. Okay. So it's it was basically the minute. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna take a bit of a break, do a little bit more brainstorming writing work, and then I will get back to the reading. <laughs> Set you there for now. Reba was also in Seven Husbands of Ethel and Hugo, but I'm not positive. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> I do love how she kind of weaves in these false memories or people having the same memory because Rod is saying, uh, I'd driven us there, so I wasn't really sure where he was going. And then Billy said, I told Rod I was leaving and made sure it was alright to get a cab home because I'd driven us over. <laughs> I'm on page 205, basically. Hi, Zelda. And I don't know if it's because I took a break from reading with my friends coming over or what. I feel like we're in this weird zone if I'm like waiting for something else to happen. I actually kind of get this way with documentaries too, unless there's like a couple quick bins in the store. There's this weird kind of like Billy, Daisy, Camilla triangle. We obviously need the band to break up that one guy to leave the band. I don't even know him. I can't even remember his name now. Very fitting for the character. And obviously we need something to happen with Karen and Graham, but like, what else am I waiting for? I should probably just keep reading. Okay, so I'm now on 229. I want to go back to... This is the first time that I thought about who was actually doing the interview because Daisy like fully addresses them. Just how honest do we have to get here? I know I told you I'd tell you everything, but how much everything do you really want to know? So anyways, I think I'm reading into it more because it's the same author of Evelyn Hugo. I just feel like a broken record now that I'm constantly comparing it to Evelyn Hugo, but because it has not the same, but a similar sort of structure to the storytelling and that the story is being told to someone else, though that someone else currently plays a minuscule role, I'm just thinking how they must be tied in. So I don't know who I, I don't know who it is. I know I told you everything, but how much everything do you really want to know? Just how honest we have to be. Anyways, so clearly it's like 
I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> every moment of the book, I'm like trying to unravel the mystery. I feel like it can't be any of the band members, so we're kind of narrowing in. Again, we're kind of getting to the point of like, it's all about to go completely downhill. The thing that we were promised at the beginning, the sort of downfall of the band is happening. Um, I do love just how funny it is <laughs> set up sometimes <laughs> where we have Eddie being like, uh, you know, Billy and Daisy thought that they were just the best things ever. And then it's them being like, yeah, we're great. <laughs> Not us, but like, anyways, it's just a very funny sort of nod. There's a couple moments like that where the way that she actually structured it gives you a laugh, even if it's like the topic itself isn't that funny, right? So it, it's fun. It's so much of it is I could see it just because it is all told through dialogue that you're like, I get why a show's being made out of it. <laughs> Especially because there are also times where I think that this would hit, if not harder, though probably harder, it would hit in a different way if we got to see it like in real time, which I think the show was going to do. I'm pointing to the TV as if the show was there. It's not there yet. We shall see. Warren and his houseboat are ridiculous and I appreciate him for being just straight up clearly comic relief in this book. <laughs> just, you know, just great. Oh, okay. I did forget that we had this like Simone Daisy exchange when Daisy goes and gets married to an Italian prince. Daisy's lucky to have a friend in Simone and I'm really confused. I hope again that the TV show shows it better because I'm like, Daisy, you are just like, I know Daisy's in a rough place, I get it. Not giving much back to Simone, frankly. <laughs> Did we even see at the beginning? Like I remember saying that I liked their friendship, but like where? What is the friendship now? It's just Simone reassuring Daisy the whole time. And I get that the point of the book is like, <laughs> Daisy Jones and the Six, uh, and not Simone and Daisy Jones and the Six. Like it's not this, they're being interviewed about the making of the band and the making of this album, but I'm like, Girl, you couldn't have done like two nice things for her. <laughs> Anyways, it just makes it a little bit harder for me to fully like the character, though I do really appreciate the character of Daisy. I think it's really a good, I think she's a good character, so. Anyways, I'm waiting to see if Simone, if Daisy's gonna have a redemption with Simone. Hey, like again, we have all of this like great stuff. Like Simone is fucking awesome. You have to have one person in your life that you know would never do anything to steer you wrong. They may disagree with you, they could even break your heart from time to time, but you have to have one person at least who you know will always tell you the truth and gets you away from the Italian press. Like, Daisy, what are you doing for Simone? <laughs> All right, it is time for a quick break. I'm gonna see if I can get my latte art to look like my nail. This is so rude. You're just gonna linger on this. You're gonna let it fester. You know we're building, but why? I knew it had to be something, but. Was, I don't know that this was the twist I wanted. I guess it can only get worse, really. <laughs> This is just rude now. <laughs> the 
and it's cramming here right now. Oh shit. Okay. 315. There's like 15, 30 pages left. I'm finally getting something. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I love that they have the actual songs for Aurora in the back, or the lyrics at least. It'll be interesting to see how that's included later. And uh, in the acknowledgements, which are very sweet. I love that uh, she thinks they're nanny. Anyways, you can tell that I was still crying. My face will look like this for the next 30 minutes at least. <laughs> More thoughts later. I need to recover. <laughs> okay, so let's let's do some wrap up thoughts. <laughs> because a lot of this book was me trying and failing to not compare it to Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, but also it's the same author using a similar shtick, and I'm not saying shtick in a bad way. Um, hopefully that comes across as I loved both of these, <laughs> both of the books. So of course they're gonna be compared. Okay, all in all, I loved this book and I especially loved the way it wrapped up in my heart, you know, it hurt. It hurt a lot in those last 40 pages or so. <laughs> Just the tears. <laughs> and I felt like ultimately we, the payoff was really there, right? So they promised me downfall and dramatics and all of these things at the beginning and they fucking gave them to me. <laughs> I will say what I found really nice through this whole thing and I almost wonder how much Taylor Jenkins Reads was putting of herself into the book. Um, they talk a lot about success and creativity and I really loved those parts of it. I think anyone who creates anything could probably relate to that and it was cool to see the different approaches that the characters had um, even within the same band and having to work together but that brings me to the characters because Billy kind of sucked for you know a lot of it. <laughs> in some ways depending on who you were. Um, what a freaking kick in the gut that he was not there for his brother at the time and obviously a lot of uh, I guess that's what I loved actually is that the characters are so flawed but in like deeply relatable and understandable ways. You know they're dealing with a lot of addiction issues which if you've had someone in your life who's dealt with addiction like that can, it can hit really hard and it is very like sex, drugs, rock and roll kind of thing. I, I just keep going back to that line about redemption. If you've redeemed yourself, believe it. I misquoting it now, I'm sure, but um, that was just like, fuck. Yeah. I thought it was interesting um, as we were kind of winding down that it basically went like the How I Met Your Mother round. And I don't know if I'm scarred from having watched How I Met Your Mother <laughs> or what, but I was just like, no, Camilla, why? Camilla was so great. Camilla was, what a wonderful character. Again, a lot of these characters are wonderful, not in ways that like, I think I read a lot of books, maybe because I, when I read fantasy, like there's something really appealing about thinking of yourself as part of that group. You're like, I wanna go on these fantasy adventures with these characters, or I wanna do this, or like I could hang out with these characters, or this is the book boyfriend or book girlfriend or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. No, none of these characters, they're all, dealing with so much shit. Specifically Billy and Daisy in large part because of their addiction but also just like you know Billy with part of his creative control and everything. They're not always the most like compassionate of people. They're very selfish and they kind of call themselves out on that which I I enjoyed. So there's this weird thing of like I don't know that I liked that Billy and Daisy are hinted at getting together in the end, kind of, you know, um, with Camila's letter to um, her daughters being like, get him back in touch with Daisy. I thought Camila's way of saving Billy through also saving Daisy um, and forcing her to leave, like, I, I guess, <sighs> yeah. And I'm not at all envious of Billy and Camila's love. I thought that was a really interesting presentation because again, I think, these love stories we often see as a way that you're like, what a beautiful portrayal of love. And there was dedication and there was love in a different kind of way that's usually presented, but I was just like, want nothing to do with that. 
<laughs> which was so fun to read. Like again, it was different um, in a lot of ways. So that part makes it fun. I, I still go back to, I'm really excited to see what they do in the series. Cause I feel like there's so much amazing material to work with, but also I think we will, I think some of the things in the book will feel more earned. I think having Daisy, Billy, Camila, Karen, Graham, and then the other people in the six. That was a lot of characters to cover. So I think that that will, seeing that growth and whatever will be really cool in the TV show. I think the way it was done makes it really interesting, makes it a very quick read, makes it, again, those one-liners, thing gut punches that are just like, ooh, and then we can kind of gloss over and move on in some ways. But not all of it feels as earned. And I think that's just the trade-off. I especially loved, you know, Daisy twisting the line at the end, um, at the concert, the, their last concert. I like that we got all of them ready to leave and ready to quit the band. And it was just a very clear, like, we're done. Um, also Warren, my drummer. <laughs> Great ending for him. Very happy for him. I liked uh, one of the lines, 240, 235, acceptance is a powerful drug and I should know because I've done them all. There was lots about being in uh, the creative industry and the music industry where Rod's talking about how um, explosive the magazine article is um, and the timing of when it came out and being like, no, this is fucking perfect for publicity and the band is internally like, what? like and so upset about it. Yeah, there was just lots of little things to really love about this. That said, I don't know that I would reread this book. <laughs> I wouldn't not reread it. Like I'm not opposed to it. Like if a friend's like, let's do a buddy read, I'd be like, cool. I would, I think it would be interesting to experience this book again, knowing for sure who it was. I don't think I ever outwardly guessed um, who it was, but I was kind of like, of the characters we've been introduced to, there was really only so many options left. And I was like, it has, yeah, does it have to be the kids? I was like trying to see how far into the future we were and like map it, but um, that, it makes sense. It'll be interesting to think back because there were a couple times where people have inconsistent memories, um, which the author's note alludes to, which also I thought was very clever to like show them having differing memories of stuff. But I do kind of wonder how many different memories that are shown are because it is the daughter who's interviewing them. So that's going to be really interesting if I were to read it again, but I don't know that I have any drive to. Sometimes I finish a book and I'm like, oh, I cannot wait to read it again. Um, I don't feel that with this one, but I am very happy to have read it. I completely see why it is a super huge bestseller. Um, I do wonder, had it not been the immediate follow-up to this one, if it would have reached those heights, but if this book has taught me anything, you, you can't know, you don't know. I think it is a wonderful, um, book in the same vein. It's just ultimately not my favorite of the two. My partner's mom dropped by and she said she loved this book and had actually read Malibu Rising, the one that I think is the next book after this and might involve some of the characters in this one. I can't remember what she said, but uh, she said that one was really good too. So I then told her she needs to pick up this one. <laughs> but for a bestseller I missed, it really hit all the key points that I wanted it to. <laughs> it made me cry, it made me chuckle, it made me think about some things, it made me take a shit ton of pictures of quotes that I just randomly like and will have to transfer to somewhere at some point, I don't know. And I completely get why it sold millions of copies and I'm excited to watch um, the TV show adaptation. And I'm excited to hear the songs. I didn't know, it's really interesting how the songs really played into everything and the fact that she wrote all the songs. Anyways, very cool. Can't wait. Um, I am, I am hyped. Yeah? Yeah. Please do comment down below. Let me know if you've read Daisy Jones and the Six. Let me know if you've read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo or any of Taylor Dickens Reed's other books, how you thought it compared, and let me know what the best-selling book is that has been on your TBR for forever that you think you'll finally pick up. I would love to know. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all very soon with a new video. Bye!